Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if I could just ask for the front lights to be turned off so that we can see the slides. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me this evening and giving me the opportunity of revisiting my most favorite adventure survival story of all time. I think it's a well-known story. Um, it's, it's an epic, it's a legend, and it's the story of Ernest Shackleton and his ship, the Endurance, and his attempt to cross the Antarctic uh, continent. I think many of you will know that it ended in absolute disaster, except that not one life was lost. And I have to give credit to your very, a very sharp committee member of, of this association, who came up with this incredible title, Beyond Endurance, because it gave me the chance to look at a slightly different aspect of the Shackleton voyage. And it's the last 36 hours of the 17-month epic. And it also gave me a time to reflect on beyond endurance. Yes, I'm looking at the time beyond the endurance. The endurance is sunk and lying at the bottom of the ocean. But when I look at that quality of, of humans, of endurance, is there anything beyond endurance? Is it, is it perhaps endurance that, that is the sole thing that is needed for survival and for success. And it made me start thinking, and I thought the title was absolutely brilliant. So thank you for that, for Beyond Endurance. Also because personally, I find the character of endurance very compelling, very beguiling, and if I have to admit it, because of some of my transcontinental cycle rides that I have done, it's very addictive. So I seek out situations where endurance is, is part of the game. So as I mentioned, I'm dealing with the very final stage of the Shackleton adventure. And it's slightly different because here we have Shackleton, Worsley, and Crean who were on board the, the endurance and now they have become the first mountaineers of South Georgia Island. Now, to put South Georgia Island slightly into context, I'd like you to look at the slide, and it shows you where South Georgia is located, uh, and perhaps it has become a little better known since the Malvinas stroke Falkland War in the 80s. Um, it, it, it here lies east of them. It's in one of the worst seas and conditions of sea in the, in the entire world. But to give you a little bit of historical perspective on South Georgia, it was first sighted in 1675. This was a sighting by a British merchant with the very French name of Anton de la Roche. And he was blown off course, he was going around the horn, and he was blown off course, so he was fairly blown off course. And he ended up having a sighting of South Georgia Island. It was a hundred years after that when there was actually a landing, and this was by Captain Cook in 1775, and it was on his second voyage around the world. He thought he'd made an amazing discovery. He thought that he had found the much sought after southern continent, the Terra Australis Incognito, and he was incredibly excited, and he decided, I'm going to keep sailing south. Um, and see what happens. In the meantime, he took possession, as was uh, uh, the, 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 the trend, and he took possession of this island in the name of King George III. Sailed south and suddenly realized that as he went round a bluff, he was sailing north again. So this was a mere island, and that point he called Cape Disappointment. But what he did do, Captain Cook, is he went back to the world and he said, I have made landfall on the most incredible island in the Southern Ocean. It is rich in fauna and flora and seals and whales and penguins and everything. And of course that news spread. And 
The sealing era started in 1786, and sealers came from all over the world, and they almost annihilated the fur seals and the elephant seals that were so prolific in the area. Once that carnage had happened, the Norwegians, who were busy creating or also involved in carnage of the whales in the north, had almost knocked off their trade there and thought, well, okay, let's see what we can find. And they went south. And so they were, when you read books of the 1900s, when the whaling, the whaling industry was started in South Georgia Island in 1902, they talk about walking across the backs of whales, across bays. So you can only just imagine how many whales there were in those days. In 1908, it became part of the Falklands Dependency, and it has been looked after by Britain ever since, except for 22 days in 1982 as part of the whole build-up to the Falklands War when it was invaded by Argentina. So to go back to the real topic of the evening, um, and it's Shackleton, and I go back to his family motto, which is, by endurance we conquer, fortitudine vincimus. And perhaps I feel a kinship with Shackleton, who was, very is, one of my great heroes. And in childhood, I sort of felt like I shared something a little similar with him, because I grew up with a very strict Calvinistic father, who gave his children precious little slack um, when it came to any failings, either physical or intellectual. And it, it, we just had to keep trying harder. And in Afrikaans, what I started to think was our family motto, which, but of course, Afrikaners never have anything as pretentious as a motto. But we were always just told by my father, Arm ho ven, which, as for those that do not speak our language, it's just keep hanging on and you will get there. So, endurance. So, on to Shackleton, and some of my pictures in this presentation come from a display that was in a Sydney Museum at the time of the centenary, because we're just a few years beyond the time that he left for this voyage. Picture of Ernest Shackleton, and just to a quick resume, that this story is really one of the greatest of the 20th century survival stories. He left in August 1914. As you know, the First World War had, had broken out, and he went south. And his idea was that he was going to go from one side of the Antarctic continent, from the Waddell Sea side, and then he had a second party going from the Ross Sea side. And this was led by Aeneas McIntosh. And they were going to walk across and, and put rations for them to, to cross. As we know, it didn't work. The one ship didn't even touch land. That was the endurance. Both ships were caught in ice and sank. And the story goes on from there. Just to see, um, I don't have a pointer, but you'll see at the top of the slides is Ross Sea. At the bottom is the Waddell Sea, and that is where the two ships were going to, uh, one was going to the top. Shackleton went down to Waddell, and to sh give you a more visual representation, that is where the Endurance went, and the Aurora was the ship that went to the Ross Sea, and that blue line is where they had proposed to walk across, and they were going to be the first. But this is what actually happened. The map there shows South America sticking out where they started at um, the Norwegian uh, whaling station called Gritviken on the 5th of December, 1914. The path goes down literally a month later. They were caught in ice and they drifted. And they drifted for a very long time until October. And you, you can see now it's going up in a northerly and northwesterly direction. And it was crushed in October 1915 and sank in November 1915. So, just to give you the fact sheet, it was called the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. 28 men 
69 dogs, one cat, and 300-ton wooden Norwegian-built ship named by Shackleton Endurance. They left, as I said, December 1914, stuck January 1915, drifted in pack ice for nine months, and eventually the ship sank in November 1915. The crew then survived on ice floes until the 9th of April 1916. That's nearly six months. They pitched their little tents, the ice broke, they shifted, and they carried on like this until they realized it was not possible. And they launched their three open boats, which were the life uh, rafts, and they spent seven days in the most horrendous conditions with ice and waves and nothing dry, and they landed eventually on Elephant Island on the 16th of April. Shackleton then decided there was no chance of a rescue from Elephant Island, and he was responsible for all these men. And he made a decision that he would go on an 800-mile journey. And I have some maps here on the side that if at the end you want to actually see the perspective of it. So this is on an open lifeboat that was adapted slightly, and they set off on this journey on the 24th of April. They did eventually make it, and I will go into that, landed on the 10th of May. Three men set off in South Georgia at 2 o'clock in the morning on the 19th of May, and three men arrived 36 hours later at Stromness Whaling Station. And I've put that in red because that is what I'm really going to concentrate on. And the remaining 22 men were rescued on the 30th of August. Just to give you just a feeling and to set the, the, the atmosphere a little bit, I'd like to just show you a few slides that uh, were taken by a, the very famous photographer that was on this expedition. He was called Frank Hurley, and I'm sure that many of you have heard of him. He was an Australian, and his expertise with the camera was really quite astounding, and somehow he stored and saved these pictures that we still see so commonly in publications on this adventure. So we've got the dogs on board, there's the cat on board, that is Frank Hurley himself with an elephant seal lying next to him with his camera on sleds, and a, a life-size model of the endurance stuck in the, in the ice, but of course the very famous photograph of Frank Hurley's, which he actually took with a, with flash, with a flash means, I'm not sure how he did it, but this photograph is, is the endurance stuck in ice and taken at night. And stuck in ice and the, and the, the ice flow is starting to open and the men trying desperately to saw off chunks of ice to try and get the endurance to an area where the water was flowing. All to no avail. And the ship was just crushed as if it was a piece of balsa, balsa wood. And this is when they set off on the, this, on, on the three life rafts, and they eventually made it to Elephant Island. Now this is a picture of Elephant Island taken on a really good day in summer. So you can imagine what it was like when they arrived, but they were absolutely ecstatic to actually see land for the first time since their departure almost a year previously. And this picture shows two of the grand sons of people who actually landed there. It's a Wordy and a Worsley, and they were on the ship that I was uh, the doctor on, and this was an expedition to commemorate the centenary of Shackleton's voyage. And it was a very poignant moment when they stood and pointed to where their grandfathers had landed all those years ago. They hauled these three life rafts and they covered them as best they could and it became their living quarters. Then, this is a picture of Frank Hurley's of the remaining 22. Um, by this stage, Shackleton had already left. He did not hang around. He felt it was his, respons his, his responsibility as a leader to try and save his crew. And they had set off on 
the James Caird, which was one of the life rafts, which they had modified, and they'd stretched canvas over the top to make a little bit of a deck. They had strengthened the keel with the mast of one of the other uh, life rafts, and they did as best they could. This is a little model, but I think the more poignant picture is the actual craft. This just shows its size. This stands in Dulwich College, which was Shackleton's College. And you can see there how the, the canvas is actually tacked into the sides. And I just had to write at the top there the size that they had to squeeze themselves into. It was five by seven feet. And it was filled with ballast as well, because Shackleton was very worried that this little boat wasn't going to survive the 800-mile journey. The, the credentials of it, for anyone that wants to know precisely, is that. And this is the picture of them loading the ballast. They sewed sacks from the blankets, and they filled these up with shale and boulders and carted it off uh, to to the boat before, before they set off, just trying to get some balance in the big waves. And Worsley, who was the navigator, was very concerned that they were going to be too close to the water. What they also took were loads, were drumfuls of um, whale blubber, which apparently, if you pour on waves that are flashing over and trying to get into the boat, it, it keeps them down. But as was said by one of the, the crew, what's the use? You know, that would have worked for one gale, but, but we had, we had uh, 16 gales. And in the end, they started to drink the blubber, the blubber oil, just in, in, in a way to stay warm. So they left. And what amazes me is that the men, the six men on this, were carefully chosen by Shackleton, some because of their, their expertise and others just because they were troublemakers and Sh Shackleton wanted to get them out of the way. And he wrote in his diary, the tale of the next 16 days is one of supreme strife and heaving waters. And something that I think is, the, is incredible, and perhaps we have lost the art of this, is how these men kept diaries. Because for the next 16 days, we have no pictures. Frank Hurley remained on Elephant Island. We have no pictures of what actually happened. We just have their diaries. Now, how on earth they were able to write diaries when they were con continuously bailing? When it got very cold, they were chipping ice off the rigging. They, were, they had six sleeping bags to start off with, which they kept in that five by seven little place in the front, which they had to crawl over the boulders. And then two of them got so frozen and rancid, and they were trying to lighten the little craft that they tossed them overboard. They were made of reindeer fur, and the reindeer fur got into their food, and it, it was just an absolute horrific mess. And yet, they kept diaries and told us about it. Worsley was the navigator, and I think he deserves the full, the full kudos for the success of getting them across the ocean. In the 16 days, he only took four readings from the sun. They only saw the sun four times. And then he had to be held by two of the other crew members to try and get a reading, and then he had to plot his course. And the reason they had, when you look at the map again, you'll see that, that, Ella, that South Georgia is, is, is much further than the Cape Horn, but it's the direction of the winds and the, and, the, and the tides that they chose to go east towards South Georgia Island. What they took with them was food for a month, because they figured if they were any longer than that, they were as good as dead. They took a sextant, logarithm charts, um, they took a, the boxes of matches that they could spare, and Worsley's words with his chronometer and his sextant and his almanac were, it really was a merry jest of guesswork. So, they eventually did sight land, and this is South Georgia. This is South Georgia taken three years ago, and I think the effects of global warming are evident 
This was a reenactment at some stage with, with um, a life-size um, replica of James Caird called the Alexandria, which is the name of his granddaughter. Again, you can notice that the snow is really not that thick. But in the time of Shackleton, it certainly was. Shackleton's comment, and I, this is another thing that I feel of this particular age and perhaps of Britishness, is they are absolute masters of the understatement. Because Shackleton's words when he saw South Georgia Island was, it was a splendid moment. <laughs> anyway, um, those are rocks that we saw that at the time of the arrival that Shackleton made it to South Georgia, and I'm going to go on to the next map, because this shows you the landfall where they saw Cape Dermador, then the most incredible hurricane hit them, and they, they almost didn't make it through the night. And they drifted and then almost smashed against the shore on the other side. And the wind beat them, and they were bailing. And at times, it was, well, they, they wrote, we held, we held the boat up to the gale during the day, enduring as best we could discomfort that amounted to pain. And that is one of the only references that Shackleton ever made to the sort of physical discomfort that they, that they were in. So eventually, when the, and in, in the storm of note is that a, a steamer, a 500-ton steamer with all its hands on deck, actually floundered and was lost. And the six of them in this little open James Caird made it. And then they, dis, and then they realized that they had to land. They could not go round um, because they had not had any water for nearly 48 hours. One of the barrels that they'd loaded at Elephant Island had cracked and it had become contaminated with seawater and they had not had fresh water for 48 hours. So they made their way in and there it says tacking to their first landing, which is Cave Cove. And they literally fell out of that little boat and they saw penguins, and they saw seals, and they saw a spring of water. And they lay down and drank their fill, and they then had the, the most hugest meal they could possibly stomach. And again, their comments on that are, wow, are we not fortunate? What will our comrades think of us? I mean, you know, <laughs> they nearly died in the effort. So Shackleton gave them four days at Cave Cove to recover, by, they had also lost their rudder, and they had to jury-rig something to go up further into um, that, that inlet in King Harkham Bay. And they eventually made, they pulled their boat, or tried to pull their boat ashore, and they couldn't. They did not have the strength. So for the first night, five of them slept while the other one held the, held the rope trying to keep the boat there. And they took turns. And eventually in daylight, and they tried to offload, and they took the deck off, and they took everything off to make it lighter so they could actually pull it up, turned it over, and they made their shelter, which they then called Peggotty Camp. Again, their sense of humor, named after a family that Charles Dickens made famous in one of his novels. So it was called Camp Peggotty. So here they were sitting, and on this map, which is a modern day map. There were no real maps of South Georgia in those days. It had never been explored. But Shackleton knew that their craft would not make it round because they were heading for Stromness, which you can see up there. Um, uh, you, you actually see the red line that they did follow, but they, he had to get to Stromness and there was no way that they could go 150 miles around. Their only option was to climb over. There was no map. No one had ever climbed over before. The only knowledge they had was this picture taken by Frank Hurley when they'd been at Stromness the months and months before, and he'd done a little bit of exploring. Again, this is a modern photograph with not as much snow. But what probably is the same, and for which probably w went a long way into saving their lives, was the wildlife. There were tussock grass, there was water, there were elephant seals and baby elephant seals and penguins. And so when we went 
on the Shackleton Centenary Voyage, that is the kind of conditions that we saw. We went on a very comfortable Russian icebreaker. Here it is. And the conditions were pretty mild. And another one of the people on the ship was a, a man called Tom Lynch, who 50 years previously had been with the armed forces of England to do and reenact the exact same uh, crossing that Shackleton was attempting to do. So it was quite poignant for him as well. So this is us landing at, the, at Pegatee Camp, getting out. I mean, we're all I mean, in the lap of luxury. We've got waterproofs, we're warm, we've had a good breakfast. But still, I can tell you, the conditions were harsh. It didn't look quite like that, but that is the kind of, the kind of ice field that Shackleton had to go over, and he knew it. This, is, this was um, recent, but still, it's, it's a fairly intimidating prospect. And all they could take with them was rations for three days. Now, I, I thought about this. You know, when, we, when I go walking into the mountains, I've got a rucksack, and I put my stuff in it. They only had socks. And they piled their rations for three days in three socks. They had a primus, they had fuel, and they had oil for six hot meals. They had 48 matches. And they had a pot which they call a hoosh pot. They just mixed all their food together and called it hoosh. They had two compasses, binoculars, and 90 foot of rope, and an adz that could be used as an ice axe, and the ship's chronometer. Now Shackleton had given his good boots away, and so now his boots were really slippery. So the carpenter took screws out of the James Caird and screwed them through the soles of his shoes so that at least he could get some purchase as they were walking up the ice. So again, we have the map there that shows they're at King Harkenbag Pegatee. And if you look directly opposite that is Possession Bay. And that is where they headed. Now, this was really an amateur mistake. I think Shackleton did know that possibly they were not headed in absolutely the correct direction, but they had no way of knowing. And I think as perhaps many of you know in life, when, when things are really tough and your, your physical reserves and your mental reserves are virtually zero, if you can take the easier option, it is, it is what you're going to do. And they took the easier option, and they headed up the ice field, and then it was a slow descent, and they walked down there, and then to Shackleton's horror, he realized there were crevasses. And I'll just take you, if you can imagine, this is a, a modern day reenactment. They've got rucksacks, they've got poles. But, but can you imagine Shackleton and them doing this in threadbare clothes, frostbitten feet? They haven't been dry for months. And then they see crevasses. And they realize that there are no crevasses near Stromness. And they have to retrace their steps and go back up and get onto the higher ground again. So they get back onto the higher ground. And then they are faced with these crags that are called the fangs. And there are three gaps. And they think, OK, there's nothing for this, but we have to head for the first gap. And they go to the first gap, and this is what they see. The outlook was disappointing, says Shackleton. I looked down a sheer precipice to chaos of crumpled ice 1,500 feet below. There was no way down for us. So they, made, they came down again, and they tried the next gap. And the next gap was equally disappointing. And on they went. And they finally got to the last gap. And Shackleton said, I don't like our position. I don't like it at all. We've got to take a risk. Are you game? Because what Shackleton knew is that, that darkness was beginning to fall. And although they had left in good weather, he'd woken them up at 2 o'clock in the morning to set off when he saw that there was a break in the weather. And he realized that they would freeze to death if they stayed at that height. So he said, we, 
are you game? And so they made a painstaking descent, 300 feet in half an hour. This is again modern day, they've got ropes, but how they did do it is that they were, they, they, did, they did tie each other together, they had Shackleton in the front, Queen in the middle, and Worsley giving directions. And then they said, this is, this is no good. This is just taking too long. We have to do something better than this. So they said, we'll slide. They coiled the rope up and they sat on it with their legs around each other, hugging each other, and they just went off where they could not see the bottom. In Worsley's diary, he obviously wrote this after the event, but he said, we seemed to shoot into space. For a, for a moment, my hair fairly stood on end. Then quite suddenly, I felt a glow and knew that I was grinning. I was actually enjoying it. I yelled with excitement and found that Shackleton and Crean were yelling too. So they eventually come to a, where it's, uh, it uh, flattens out. They shake themselves off. And what do they do? They turn around and they shake hands with each other. They had made that first hurdle. Another thing that was interesting in these men's diaries, particularly during this mountain climb, is how considerate they were to each other, how mannerly they were. And perhaps that's part of endurance. When you know that no one has any psychological reserve at all, you have to be very careful not to waste emotional energy. And they were polite to each other, mannerly, and, and considered each other as much as was possible. This looks like a very beautiful slide, um, and it is where they actually came over. They came over from, from the, the right-hand side here, and this is down into Fortuna Bay. Again, they were slightly off track, and they got very excited because they had, it was a downhill, although it did take them three hours to get down. Again, they saw crevasses, and they realized there are no crevasses on Stromness and they realized they were wrong. So they climbed all the way back. But that was Fortuna Bay, and Fortuna Bay nowadays looks like this. And I'm sure they saw this, but I'm sure they had eyes for nothing but Stromness. There are elephant seals. There are penguins. King penguins by the million. Breeding, those are just penguins. South Georgia is like creation to me. It's just things being made and created and breeding and, and nature uh, is so abounding and so close to you. But I'm sure that Shackleton, Crean and Worsley did not see any of it. They just looked at those mountains in the background but once they'd regained altitude, they saw, and, and we actually climbed to the point where they must have stopped after regaining the altitude. And they looked across at the formation on the left there, and Shackleton recognized that. He said, those are the peaks that are close to Stromness. We've just got to get around them or over them, and we will be at Stromness. And what they did is they were so exhausted that Shackleton said, okay, we can, have, we can have a rest here. And Worsley and Crean fell onto, this, onto the snow absolutely exhausted. They were in each other's arms looking for warmth. And Shackleton realized that if they slept for too long or if he fell asleep, they were dead. So he let them sleep for five minutes. And then he woke them up and he said, okay, you've slept for half an hour. That's enough. Up you get, and he got them up and said, okay, you make some hooch, because up to this point, what they had done is they, they walked for 15 minutes and they rested for one minute, and then they lay on the snow for that one minute, and they made, they made hot food every four hours if they could. Anyway, he said, while you're making hooch, I'm going to climb to a high point and see if I can see anything of note, because I know that, that, we are, that we are close. 
This was about 24 hours gone, or more like 30 hours gone. And he climbed, to the, he climbed to one of the ridges, and he heard what he thought was a whistle. This was at 6.30 in the morning, and he knew that if that was the whistle at the whaling station at Stromness, they would hear another whistle at 7 o'clock. And he came down in a great hurry and said, we've got to listen at 7 o'clock. And sure enough, at 7 o'clock, they heard a whistle. And it was the first man-made, or the first sound from the outside world that they had heard since they left Stromness um, in the December of 1914. What did they do? They turned around and they shook hands with each other again. <laughs> Shackleton knew that they were going to make it. They had 12 miles to go. And when you look at this territory, 12 miles over that is no easy task. But they endured and they knew that they could do this. And they, they climbed, and eventually we'll deal with that. But I would like to take a little uh, sideways journey here and just look at what has, has happened in South Georgia since this momentous climb that Shackleton and his two comrades did. Duncan Cass was a surveyor in 1951 to 1957, and he did produce maps and survey of the area. In 1955, uh, the combined forces, sorry, it's supposed to be 65, and that's Tom Lynch, the guy that I showed you. That there were 10 of them, and they did follow the, the tracks. It took them very much longer. Then, in 2000, they wanted to make an IMAX film, and they got three of the best mountaineers in the world. Reinhold Meisner, who's Italian, Conrad Anker, who is American, and Stephen Venables, British, all very, very well-known mountaineers. And they decided to go alpine style, which means light. A little backpack, all the rest of it. And I'd like to just read what their comments were. Conrad Anker said, what Shackleton and his crew endured is beyond what I think anyone nowadays would be able to do. Even in the most demanding climbs I've done, I've never got close to what those guys were doing. Venables, Stephen Venables, and he wrote this on the second day of their three days. How are we going to get out of here? We were hidden in a labyrinth of ice. If we were out there without a tent, we probably wouldn't survive very long. So you really, really do wonder how those three survived for 36 hours climbing over peaks of uh, 1,200 meters and snow and ice and crevasses. Tim Jarvis and another group in January 2013 walked the 40 kilometers, which is exactly the same route that Shackleton did. It took them 96 hours and they were well equipped. For Shackleton, in May 1916, it took them 36 hours. Since then, there have been small private climbing expeditions, and like what I was um, from the ships, they do take the tourists up, and then you go from Fortuna Bay just over into Stromness, which does give you very much the feeling of it, but wow, <laughs> it's nothing like what they had. So this would have been the view that as they made their descent, which was still quite dangerous, and they do talk of getting to a, a, an icy slope, which they started to hack steps with the ads. And eventually Shackleton, who had really at this point probably lost all patience, said, no, just tie a rope around me. I'll go on my back. I'll kick steps in the ice, and I'll make them for you. And so Worsley, in an equally precarious position, was now belaying Shackleton down this. And if anything had happened, both of them would have been down there, and that would have been the end. And then they came to a waterfall. Now again, we're seeing this when the snow is s distinctly less than when they did. It's a 25 meter, sorry, 25 foot drop. And they came to this and they said, no, let's just go down through it. So they tied their aging rope to a rock and they sent Cream down first and, and he disappeared completely. You couldn't see him, you could just hear water. But he there was still weight on the end of the rope, and they figured right. And eventually he said, right, I've made it. And then the next two came down, and they were so excited 
that they just abandoned the rope and went on. And this is our, our expedition looking at this waterfall and just imagining these three coming down. And when they got to the bottom, they shook hands. <laughs> and so on to Stromness. Stromness is now a deserted whaling station. There is no more whaling. It ended in the 60s in South Georgia. Still rather um, picturesque in its own way. And they walked in from the wrong side of South Georgia. They walked in from the west. And they were met by children who looked at these three men in absolute horror. Their hair was long, their beards were matted, they could hardly walk, their clothes were torn. And these children scampered off in horror, yelling and screaming because they thought they were ghosts. And there were two men that saw them. And of course, they had spent time in Stromness, but no one recognized them. And eventually, they came to the boss of the whaling station, who still didn't recognize them. But then, finally, when their identity was made known, people were absolutely horrified at what they had achieved. And of course, they shaved their, their um, beards off, cut their hair, ate and drank. But Shackleton continued to have in his mind that there were 22 men on Elephant Island who'd had no news. They had overwintered under the boats. They decided August was their last possible month of rescue. And Shackleton, who'd left Frank Wilde in charge, had said, if you reach October, you have to make some attempt to get off Elephant Island. You have to make one of the other boats seaworthy, and you have to head for Deception Island, which was only 250 kilometers to the west, uh, northwest, and see if you can intercept a whaling boat. And, and Frank Wilde was waiting to make this decision. And then we have to also remember that there were three men sheltering under the James Caird at Pegatty Camp. And Worsley found a boat and set off. But they took nearly four days to get back because a blizzard raged. And they realized that had that weather caught them on the mountain, they would have died. They just had a break in the weather that was, was quite unbelievable. The story of the final uh, fetching of the 22 is a, is a really, it must have been so incredibly frustrating for Shackleton. It was the fourth boat that he managed to get that finally got there. He'd appealed to the Admiralty, to the British Navy. They were all embroiled in a war. They said, no, we can send one in September. They tried. The Chileans said, no, we've got one for you. It got caught in ice. Another expedition tried. They also got caught in ice. The fourth vessel was a Chilean tug called the Yelcho. And they arrived on the 30th of August. And the picture here, it's a Frank, uh, Frank Hurley picture again, that they're about to be rescued after 22 months. And I, I, the, the, at the very bottom here, there is a quote that I've just got to read because I think it also captures the feeling in a very low-key fashion. And it's from, it's, it's from Frank Wilde's journal. I felt jolly near blubbing for a bit and could not speak for several minutes. <laughs> anyway, they had arrived in time because Frank Wilde was planning to leave on the 5th of October. When all 22 were delivered back to Pinta Arenas in Chile, Shackleton dashed off a letter to his wife. And what his words were, um, wait, but I've got to just find this here. He said, he said to his wife, I have done it, damn the Admiralty, not a life lost, and we have been through hell. So that's them boarding, going out in the small vessels, and it took them, no, it took them an hour, and they were on that ship, and they were gone. So what happened to Shackleton? He'd saved all his crew members. He returned to a world at war. He was not welcomed with open arms by the British. 
The Argentinians and the Chileans thought he was really quite a hero. But there were comments to the effect of, what are you doing messing around on icebergs when you should be fighting a good war? He was too old to sign up. And so the war, he, he had a desk job during the war, but many of his crew members served actively and were killed. He then still had the ice and the south in his blood, and he wanted to return. And he mounted a rescue with the help of one of his good friends who was a sponsor. And they had a, another little Norwegian wooden ship called the Quest. And they set off for Gritviken, which is just round the corner from Stromness. And this, this is a picture of Gritviken. And while they were anchored there, getting ready for the expedition down south, he had a heart attack, a massive heart attack. He was 47 years old, and he died on the 5th of January, 1922. His body was put on a ship and was taken to Montevideo, and they then managed to get hold of his widow. And she said, no, you can't bring him home. His heart and his soul is in the south. Take him back to Gritviken. Bury him at Gritviken. Bury him with his head pointing to the south because that's where his thoughts always lie. So Gritviken now exists. It's no longer a whaling station. It's, it's a national trust kind of place with a museum and the old remnants of the whaling, the whaling industry. This is the church that is still in use, and we went into this church because in the church is a plaque to Frank Wilde. Now, Frank Wilde, I think, was an integral part of the survival of the people on this expedition. And of interest, and perhaps many of you know, but Frank Wilde died in South Africa. Frank Wilde ran a pub in Galel, which is in Zululand over there. Maybe some of you have even been to it. And he, he really had, he struggled and did not have a totally happy life in South Africa. But recently, his diaries were uncovered with his aunt. And in his diary, it expressed very clearly his desire to be buried next to the boss, who, of course, was Shackleton. They exhumed his bones and went on a special trip to take his ashes and bury them next to the boss. So Frank Wilde now lies next to Shackleton. This is Shackleton's grave at Gridviken, and standing next to it is Alexandra Shackleton, his granddaughter. What is interesting in this is that he is the only one that is buried north-south. All the rest are buried east-west. And there are uh, quite a number of graves there of the, the Norwegian whalers. Um, and the setting, as you can see, is a one of great tranquility and peace. But there is a ritual that you have to you have to do when you go to Shackleton's grave. And I have now done it twice, and I'll do it every single time I go. And that is that you stand at his graveside with a little glass of whiskey, and you toast the boss. And you drink your whiskey, but you leave a little bit to throw on his grave. I went around the back of his gravestone, and I read this inscription that I think perhaps is the essence of Shackleton. He was, he, was a, he was a man that loved poetry, and one of his poets that was dear to him was Robert Browning. And these are words of Robert Browning, but they were favorite words of Shackleton. I hold that a man should strive to the uttermost for his life's set prize. And I think that we have to agree that Shackleton certainly stood by those words. So I would like to conclude with a little piece that was written in Caroline Alexander's book, which is here, called The Endurance, in her summing up of the characters of Shackleton. At the core of Shackleton's gift for leadership in crisis was an adamantine conviction that quite ordinary individuals were capable of heroic feats if the circumstances required. The weak and the strong could and must survive together. The mystique that Shackleton acquired as a leader may partly be attributed to the fact 
that he elicited from his men strength and endurance that they had never imagined. He ennobled them. And I think that word ennoble is, is a most interesting and unusual word and perhaps should never be used too lightly. So I'd like to end this talk by going back to his family motto, which is, by endurance we conquer. And if I had to modify it slightly, I would say, by endurance and ennoblement, we conquer. Thank you.